I hope you had a chance to look at Genesis chapter 3. I would like to show you something before we read the text. I believe by this time you've noticed that the Bible is not just an ordinary writing. It is a masterpiece. It is more than just somebody sitting down and writing something. As literature, the Bible is very well thought out. And you can see how a different pattern of thought than the one we are used to is used in the Bible. And the most obvious pattern is this chiastic kind of structure in which you have ideas that are parallel to one another. Ideas that go on one side and the other of the chiasm. Now, this can be a larger structure, but within that larger structure, you may be able to see a smaller chiasm, something like this, this structure here. Even something smaller, like this. Or you can see a structure similar to this one, maybe here, where you have two parallel ideas. Why am I emphasizing this? Because when you read the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament, because the New Testament, although it was written in Greek, those that wrote it, most of them had Jewish mind. So you shouldn't be surprised to see the same kind of pattern in the New Testament as well. But in the Old Testament, almost all over the place, you will see the same pattern. A Hebrew mind is not linear. It's not A, B, C. It can be A, B, and back to A. Or A, B, C, B, A. Right? Like this. A, B, C, B, A. Right? So when you read the Bible, it's very important to look for thoughts or words that repeat themselves. If you read a story of the Bible, it's very important to look and see, okay, so how does this story start and how does it end? Are there parallel ideas? If yes, then pay close attention to it because there is a good likelihood that that story is leading somewhere. Because usually the role of the chiastic structure is this. To show you what the main idea is. Last time, we looked at chapters 2 and 3 from the book of Genesis. And I pointed out that chapters 2 and 3 belong together. Yes, chapter 2 is a creation account, a creation story. It's not in opposition to chapter 1 where you have the six plus one days of creation, it is complementary to it. But the role of that story is to parallel the other side of the story because right here in the middle, we had the story of the fall. So the fall was the focal point of that chiastic structure. Now, this morning, we are doing something similar, right in chapter 3. So we, we don't have chapter 2 and 3 together. It's only chapter 3, and it looks like this, A, B, C, D, and you have this point here, and it comes back to A. But the focal point this time is the Messiah. The first thing I would like to read is the exact focal point of this chiastic structure, and that's chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. 
So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And now verse 15. And I will put enmity between you. Who is you here? Satan, right? The serpent. Okay? I will put enmity between you, Satan. And that's a singular there. And the woman. Who's the woman? Eve. Again, singular. So first we have enmity between Satan and the woman. Two entities. Then it goes on saying, And between your seed, whose seed? The serpent's seed on one side, right? And her seed. Whose seed? The woman's seed. Interestingly, this concept of seed is a collective or corporative concept. When you speak about somebody's seed, you refer to his or her descendants. Now, it can be biological or it can be spiritual, depending on what you are talking about. So you have the serpent and Eve. You have the serpent's seed as a collective plural the serpent's descendants, and Eve's descendants, collective plural again, he, and this is interesting, so now the plural is narrowed down again to one, a singular, he, who he, because we are speaking about the serpent and the woman, the serpent's descendants, the woman's descendants, and then he, who he. Who's that? He. That's the Messiah. Because out of the seed of the woman, there is somebody that stems out. Right? He, the Messiah, as a singular there, shall bruise, a better word would be crush, not just bruise, crush your head, and you, who you? The serpent, Satan behind the serpent, shall bruise or crush his heel. Have you ever seen the movie The Passion, the one made by Mel Gibson? Do you remember one of the episodes there with the serpent? When Jesus is praying, and at one point the serpent comes close to him, and then he stands up, it's very interestingly done, and he just does this to the serpent. It's a throwback, right, a flashback to this prophecy from the Bible, from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. What's interesting is that this word in the Hebrew that is translated by bruise or crush is a very strong word. And it has something very specific in it. Of course, Jesus crushed the head of the devil through death. He died and he got resurrected. And through resurrection, he, so to speak, crushed the head of the devil. Now, there is another moment when the Messiah will crush the head of the devil at the end of the drama of sin. The devil will be destroyed. So, it's interesting that the Messiah hits the head. Right? The serpent, or the devil, can only hit the heel. But some people have noticed something interesting in the practice of crucifixion, of crucifying people at that time. When they nailed their feet to the cross, 
it wasn't from the front like this, not like this. It was from the side and they would put in the nail right between the heel bone and the one next to it. Because if they did it frontally like this, then they could possibly free themselves. They could have possibly broken the skin, the flesh, and just free themselves. But if it was done like this, on the side, so from the side to the pole, like this, you could not free yourself. So it's pretty vivid. It's pretty detailed, if you want to see that detail in it. Obviously, this is the first written prophecy about the Messiah. This is the middle, right, the focal point of the chiasm. So please look at letter G before and after. Letter G before. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Please notice that right after the Messiah promise, God speaks to whom? Again, to the woman, right? So you have that same idea. God speaks to the woman before, God speaks to the woman right after. I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Please notice something. God says, I will greatly multiply two things. The sorrow and the conception. Some people explain that this multiplying of conception for the women has a meaning in the context of the fact that after the fall, the lifespan started to shrink. But the initial commandment of God to Adam and Eve was grow and multiply and fill the earth. Now, if somebody's lifespan is shorter, in order to complete that mandate, you need to give birth multiple times. Then it says, your desire shall be for your husband. So the woman in pain will bring forth children. After a man sees how a delivery happens, a man would ask, how on earth would this woman want another child? So, so this is what the passage says. Yes, in pain you shall bring forth children. And yet, your desire shall be for your husband. Even if it's painful, you will continue to desire your husband. You will not reject him. But in this, this contrast, it's pain, but it's still desire there. I see a reflection of some sort of messianic feature. Why? Because then it says, and he shall rule over you. So this is the first encounter between God and the woman right after the fall. And God tells the woman, yeah, some things broke. Some things will come with pain, with hurt now. And yet, you have not lost your desire for your husband. You will be able to enjoy life. Not only that, your husband will provide for you will rule over you, not in the sense in which Adam ruled the animals, but in the sense of a benevolent king that provides for those that are in his kingdom. This aspect of uh, mashal, that's the word in Hebrew, mashal, I believe is also a reflection of the Messiah, because later on the man becomes the priest of the family. So it's a divinely ordained mission or role of the husband in the family to be the priest of the family. He shall rule over you 
does not mean that he's superior and she is inferior. It is a, an expression of the fact that he will attend to her needs. Because remember what happened right before the fall. Instead of him going to Eve and tell her, Eve, let's go from here. Let's not get into this. He failed her. It's like God telling the man, I will work with him. I will allow, I will help him to come back to his role. Because if the pre-fall role of men and women was complementary, then it would have been expected. If she gets in trouble, he would help her out. If he gets in trouble, she would go and help her out. Then it goes on. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So F verse 9. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. So this is God speaking to Adam before. What does God do after he speaks to the women? To whom does he speak? Adam, again, right? So you can see that on one side and on the other, God now speaks to Adam. What does God say to Adam? Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, verse 17, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweet of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Please notice something. The only time the word curse appears is verse 17. And it's a curse on the earth, on the ground. Why is it important? Some have suggested that when the humans fell, God cursed the humans, God, meaning God cursed the man, God cursed the woman, and uh, because now we are cursed by God, that's why we have so many problems in our families. The text doesn't say that. The only time the word curse appears is when God says, cursed is the ground for your sake. So as a result of the fall, the ground was cursed, not the man, not the woman. On the contrary, to the woman, God speaks in a redemptive if you want, in a messianic way. But here, the ground is cursed, and yes, um, it takes toil now and sweat. And uh, then God says that the man will return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So it's a hint, a powerful hint, on the fact that what God told Adam before, that you will die, is happening. Because God tells him, yes, you will go back to the ground. You were taken from the dust, you are going back to the dust. The question is, why didn't they like die immediately like that? There are some that uh, have speculated and said, well, Peter says, 2 Peter 3.8, that uh, for God, a thousand year is like a day, and a day is like a thousand year. So then Adam died within the first thousand years. Adam and Eve both died within the first thousand years, and that's the explanation. 
Some others would say, no, the explanation is in the fact that when the fall happened, they started dying. On that very day, they started dying, which is true in a way, because when the fall happened, God immediately started speaking to Adam and tell him, hey, you're going back to the ground, right? Or another explanation is that they did not die physically on that day, but in reality, God had to provide for their life, so somebody else died in a symbol. Why? Because in the next sections, you will see that God gave them skin clothes, and obviously skin does not grow on trees. My understanding of the passage is that they did not die immediately like that. Yes, they started to die. They started dying when they fell. But the text did not say that in the moment or on the day they will sin, they will disobey God, they will instantly die. The text says in Hebrew, you will surely die. The Hebrew concept is dying, will you die? Will die, dying. It does not mean that, uh, okay, you will die now spiritually and you will die physically at a different time. Some people suggested that too. When the Hebrew repeats a word, it is certainty. It's something that will happen. But it does not mean that it will happen right away like that. Because the concept bayom can mean, yes, when you will sin, this will happen to you. But it doesn't say exactly if it will happen right away or it will be a process. It will take some time and then it will be completed. So it's not contradictory because some said, yeah, see, God said if you eat or the day you eat, you will die. He did not die. So God lied. No, he did not because death started to happen. And as they say, now when we are born, we start dying already. In D, section D, verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. If you jump to the end of it, D, verse 21, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So see how the idea of clothing appears on both sides. First, Adam and Eve putting some things together so they can clothe themselves. And then God gives them clothes. Okay, so obviously you have the parallel ideas. C. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Same idea is reflected back in uh, verse 22. Then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Knowing good and evil, knowing good and evil. Right? B, section B. God said, verse 3, the last part, You shall not eat nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And B, in the second uh, half of the chiastic structure, and now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Right? So, lest you die and live forever in the two passages. And uh, now let's go to A. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? That's verse 1. Has God said that? No. Have you noticed how at the end of the story that's exactly what happens? They cannot eat of any tree from the garden. Why? Why? Because they are driven out. 
verse 24, so he, that is God, drove out the man and he placed cherubim, or cherubim, at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So the first humans were driven out from the garden. So again, you have those parallel ideas. To me, it is very important to see in this story the concept of the Messiah. Because what it tells me, and probably you too, is that uh, in the middle of um, the rock bottom experience, God jumps in and says, hey, I have a solution for you. Yes, death is happening, but grace is also happening right away. And that's why this messianic prophecy in this chiastic structure is so crucial. Because uh, from this point on, you will see as we progress with the book, at every step of the way, God jumps in in a redemptive or in a messianic way when people struggle. First in the story of Cain and Abel, then in the story of uh, the global flood, then in the story of uh, the Tower of Babel, and uh, then in the life of the patriarchs from Abraham all the way to Joseph and his sons, right? So that's my presentation, and now it's your time for questions because that's my favorite part of it. So the question was, can it be argued that Christianity is the oldest religion? Yes, but in a certain way. Christianity, the word Christian, comes from Christ. Christianity is the religion of Christ, so to speak. Nevertheless, it did not start with Christ because there's a difference, a major difference between Christ and any other religious founder. As you know, there are founders of religions like Muhammad, right? or Confucius. There are founders of religions. Jesus is not a founder of religion. He did not start any religion. He came to restore a religion, the religion of Yahweh. And as I pointed out earlier, starting with chapter 2, God, Elohim, also appears as Yahweh. Yahweh meaning the God of the covenant. Yes, from that perspective, I have no doubt that this is the oldest religion, the religion of uh, the almighty and eternal God, Yahweh. And Jesus, what Jesus did is he came to reform or bring back a religion that because of uh, human weakness was kind of uh, distorted and neglected in many ways. Yes. Thank you. Very good question. Did God continue to visit Adam and Eve after the fall? Is there any proof of interaction between God and Adam and Eve after the fall? I can point out at least one of them. If you go to chapter 4, verse 25, it says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another, God being the same Elohim, for God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Now, I don't know if there was any kind of physical presence or appearing of God to Adam and Eve at this point. What I know is that Adam and Eve recognize 
in the conception of Seth, God. God is the giver. I have another moment, Alan, when God speaks not to Adam and Eve directly, but to Cain. In chapter 4, God speaks to Cain. It looks like God spoke with him somehow in a very vivid and uh, almost physically present way. Verse 6 in chapter 4. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? The conversation is obvious. To what extent Cain could see God at this time, we don't know. Now, going on in the Bible, God appears here and there to different people. He speaks with Abraham, right? He also speaks with um, Isaac and Jacob. We don't know exactly how. About Moses, later on, we know that with Moses, says God, I speak face to face, right? So then, somehow God was interacting with Moses face to face. Physical presence is involved. But if you go to John chapter 1 in the New Testament, John chapter 1, 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. So if I understand this right, then no one ever has seen God the Father. That does not imply that no one ever saw the Son, Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ, the Son, the pre-incarnate Son of God, the one called in the Old Testament Michael, He appeared to people. I believe He was the one that spoke to Moses face to face. So He could equally appear to Adam and Eve as well. And I believe that in the Old Testament, the God called Yahweh, is Jesus Christ pre-incarnate. Elohim is uh, a corporative way of calling the Godhead because of the plural ending, Elohim, God, as a corporate reality. But when the Bible says Yahweh God or the Lord God, then it's a direct pointing to Jesus Christ as God. So the question is, so when God, right after the fall, visited Adam and Eve, was it God the Father or was it Jesus Christ, the one that provided, that spoke with them first, right? Spoke to Eve first, then spoke to Adam, then gave them tunics so they can have clothes. Who was it? Was it Elohim? In general, was it the Father? Or do we know that it was specifically Jesus Christ? Can you point out in the text the answer? Verse 21, first part. This is what it says. Also for Adam and his wife, who? The Lord God. So that is Yahweh Elohim. So who is it? Jesus Christ. Very good question. Thank you. So those cherubims that were placed to guard uh, Garden of Eden, how long did they do that? Up to the moment when the flood came? I sense that behind your question is the assumption that something happened to the Garden of Eden at the flood or right before the flood. Many people would ask this. So, where was the Garden of Eden? Because in the Garden of Eden, you have some names of rivers. Among them, you have uh, Euphrates, also Tigris, Hidekel. So, can we say that the Garden of Eden was in uh, the Middle East, 
where now you have the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers? Not really. Why not? Because if you read the description in chapter 2, you will see that those rivers have a starting point. They all four come out from one starting point and then branch out. When it comes to the current reality that you can find in Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia is the land between the two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates. Those two rivers don't stem from the same point. They come from different areas. Okay? So, no, what I think has happened historically is the same that can happen when you go to Paris. That's in France. Most people, when you say Paris, will think of the city in France, right? But then you may know also that there are Parises in all different areas of the world, even in America. You have Paris in America as well. Jerusalem. If I say Jerusalem, you would think about the city that is in Israel, right? But there is Jerusalem here in the United States as well, or Philadelphia, right? So there were names given to places, settlements, mountains, rivers, so on and so forth, somewhere, and settlers came from there, established a new space of living and gave those names. But then, back to your question, what happened to the Garden of Eden? I don't know exactly. Ellen White says that before the flood, God took it away. Some believe that means that God took it to heaven. Why? Because the way the New Jerusalem is described in the book of Revelation, chapters 21 and 22, it is obvious that the language is the language of the Garden of Eden. But I don't know if the description of the Garden of Eden in the New Jerusalem is the same as the Eden from the earth. It can be inferred that, yes, those uh, cherubim guarding the garden would be a potent reminder for the humans that would pass by, hey, this used to be the original house, garden house of humans. How come Adam also took from the forbidden fruit? The short answer, the short answer is it's, it's hard to say. I believe it was the same kind of curiosity that caught Eve, that also caught Adam at one point. Ellen White says that he thought, okay, so I'm going to lose her now. But the text doesn't explain that, the biblical text. I believe a, a good lesson from it is don't judge somebody that sins because you may become vulnerable to the same kind of temptation. That's a philosophical question. So the question is, how could evil somehow originate from a good, such a good creator? I call it a philosophical question because we don't know. And philosophy is the science, if it can be called that, that tries to explain things that are very hard to grasp. But the question is very good. Because, yes, we would say, no, God did not create the evil. God created perfect beings. And the first being that rebelled against God was a perfect being, Lucifer. That's the name we get from the Bible later on. And uh, it was an angel, an archangel. And that means a leader of some sort of the angels. But was he evil? Was he created to be evil? The answer to that is no. God did not create evil. Nevertheless, the necessary conclusion is that God created beings with the potentiality of evil. 
which is different. What is the difference? The difference is that anybody that was created by this creator, any intelligent being at least, has the possibility to choose between going this way or that way. But when God creates beings with the potentiality of being faithful to God, that's what we call love, love by necessity implies free will or the power of choice. And if you have the power to choose, then you can choose pro or con, for God or against God. There is something that I think can be very misleading to us. Because when we speak about evil, most of the time we speak about violent evil. That's what we conceive of as being evil. Something that is violent, that inflicts pain upon somebody. That's evil. That is evil indeed. But evil in its kernel, in its origins, is not necessarily violent. Somebody can be evil without being violent. And I believe right at the beginning, when uh, a created being decided to go against God, not for God, and go against the one that established this love relationship, right at that point, it's not about violence. It's about a decision that down the road will bring violence in. Lucifer rebelled against God. What happened? Well, nothing special right away. Nevertheless, down the road, we know where it took us and what the effects of sin, of rebellion against God or not reflecting back the love of the Creator will produce. That's the very subversive, subversive nature of sin. But you're good with, with your question. Yes, God did not create evil, but creation out of love and for love entails the potentiality of evil. So the verse... Chapter 3, verse 1 says that the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. If the serpent is the medium of the devil, the devil or Lucifer or Satan was a very smart being, and I believe he still is smart in a certain context, but he also used the most intelligent animal from uh, planet Earth to be the medium through which he can use temptation and be effective with the human race. In the text, you can see guilt as a direct consequence of the fall, of disobedience. I think in every situation, unless somebody kills the conscience, then guilt will, will kick in, I believe. Yes. Thank you so much. God bless. Happy Sabbath.